Um, all right, so as Sarah mentioned, I work at Google. I work on anything and everything related to web performance. I work with the Google Chrome team and many other teams within Google. And within the past year, we've actually spent a lot of time within Google trying to figure out how do we get all of our services towards HTTPS. So we, in fact, have an explicit HTTPS 100 goal, which is all Google products should be on HTTPS 100% of the time. And uh, that is a rule for any new release. Any new product must be HTTPS. And we're actively working on updating um, all of our existing products towards this goal. In parallel to all of that, while I'm working with uh, the different teams at Google, trying to help them understand what the challenges are and all the rest, I've also spent a lot of time uh, talking to outside developers, uh, companies like uh, you guys here and uh, many other individual developers, trying to understand what are the bottlenecks? Why can't we have HTTPS uh, everywhere? Because fundamentally, we believe that it is a good thing. And very briefly, why do we care about this, right? There's three properties that HTTPS or TLS gives us. It's the authentication, the fact that we can verify the identity of the server, which is very important for delivering a, a good experience. Uh, there's data integrity, making sure that data does not get modified while in transit, and finally encryption. Typically, we uh, tend to focus on encryption, but it's important to recognize that the first two are actually very important as well. And they serve two purposes. They protect you as a user, right? They protect your privacy and experience, and they also protect the site or the, uh, the company assets uh, that is providing that experience as well. So it's a benefit on both sides. Now, you may have also seen some news recently, this is as of late uh, August, where the search team has basically announced that uh, we are now using HTTPS as a ranking signal. So uh, that by itself actually, I think, turned a lot of heads uh, in the community because, uh, well, for a variety of reasons, but what it has done in the last couple of months, uh, just being on, on the front end of kind of receiving lines from developers, is I've gotten a lot more questions about HTTPS. How to enable it, how to make it efficient, how, what is the cost, uh, what are the trade-offs, uh, and all the rest. And frequently I hear Nginx in the same sentence, which is like, okay, well, I'm running Nginx, and how do I do it well, right? Um, I know it supports it, but what about performance? And I've actually done quite a bit of research over the past year, looking at all the different servers, trying to understand what are the gotchas, what, where are the areas that we can improve. And I know this is quite a bit to digest, but I am willing to bet that there's a lot of people in this room who are very technical, who look at this chart and just mentally check off all the boxes and say like, yep, 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 configured that, I know this, I know that, and all the rest. The reality is, for most people outside of this room, most of these things are technical gobbledygook. They have no idea what this means, and the fact that Nginx is, in fact, one of the best options for CLS termination is a great testament for the great product that the team has built here and that you guys are contributing to and, and, are, and are working with. But in practice, the fact that most of these are green does not mean that, in reality, they are green when they're being deployed. And this is actually something that I want to kind of motivate you guys to think about as to how do we improve this moving forward. So, this is a common theme that I come across uh, when I go out and talk about performance or any sort of uh, technical, uh, I guess, topic in general, which is a curse of knowledge, is when you're embedded in this community, when you think about your uh, optimizations or the particular niche that you're, that you're focusing on, you tend to become blind to the things that developers don't know. You can't picture somebody not knowing what you know. So it seems obvious to you that, yes, if I put a config flag in there and I just add a little blurb that says blah, you know, enable this to en enable better performance, everybody will just be smart enough to read the documentation and enable that flag, right? Not true. Uh, further, because there are so many different flags and now we have hundreds of them in Nginx and all other, all other service, it basically becomes an impossible task. You need to be a full-time developer just to understand, like a full-time Nginx config developer just to understand how to configure this thing in an optimal way. So we need to do a better job of optimizing for this. So the technical bits are there. Nginx gives you all the right knobs to make your stuff fast. But what we need to do is deliver a much better experience on the defaults. Defaults, assume that defaults won't be changed. That is basically the case. And one of the things that's true now, now that we've uh, kind of gone out and said, look, everything should be under HTTPS, you've, you've heard the numbers from Gus about the amazing growth of Nginx. You went from 16 million sites to 160 million. That's a lot of sites in the long tail that are basically doing apt get, install Nginx, start service. Those are the defaults. Assume those won't be changed. So whatever goes into the defaults will impact 
how most of the web will perform. And that is why this is so, so important. So assume the worst. And I think one thing we can do a lot more of, uh, which we don't currently do, is add warnings, alerts, and linters. So things like not just, hey, your config has passed the syntax check. It won't crash your server. But hey, you, I think you forgot to enable this thing. Or did you really mean to do this? Or did you forget about this other option? Right? We need to provide that better experience for users. Because let's face it, even the best of us that are thinking about this full time, life happens. You forget about it. Other things get in the way. Uh, somebody else checks in some extra code. And before you know it, uh, you fall off the rails. So now let's talk about the actual HTTPS experience. The plain text HTTP version goes something like this. You have a DNS lookup. You have TCP uh, handshake. You make an HTTP request. And then you send the HTTP uh, request response. Everything's good. The textbook TLS version is the same, except you also have two extra round trips in there, one with the client and server hello, and then change, change ciphers. Except this is the textbook version. It says there's extra two RTTs. In practice, when I actually look at the sites that are being deployed today, it is much, much worse. So first, most sites are actually missing intermediary certificates, which means that you don't have the full certificate chain. We need to, the browser will stop and go out and fetch the other certificates uh, from, uh, from the provider, which obviously adds latency. After that, we say, well, we don't actually know if the certificate is valid, so let's make another request to the OCSP checkpoint. So that's yet more round trips. Uh, after that, we, of course, discover that you, in fact, meant to redirect us to the mobile version of the site, which lives in the domain, which means we need to repeat the entire process all over, at which point we arrive at another destination, which tells us that, no, really, uh, we meant the dub, dub, dub version of the mobile site. Uh, so you repeat this process several times over. And then finally, uh, once you actually start delivering data, the server is by default uh, optimized to deliver for, uh, optimized for delivering throughput, not latency, uh, which is a valid configuration for some deployments, but is not a valid uh, or optimal configuration for most cases uh, related to web browsing. So this is the default experience, which in the end, ends up being some arbitrarily large number of RTTs. So whenever you hear, hey, TLS is slow, when I enable it, my site just becomes uh, really, really slow. This is basically what they mean. When you just apt get install and you turn this on, this is the experience you're going to get. And I know we can do better. So the end goal, if you know what you're doing, you can do this today, is that Deploying TLS will add, at most, one round trip to your TLS handshakes. That is a reliable experience, whether it's a new connection or a resume connection. But you have to know a lot of things to get this thing right. And what I'm trying to motivate you guys is think about how we can get this better, easier, and uh, allow developers to not have to think about this stuff as much. So let's start with the basics. For, for the purposes of all of the subsequent slides, I'm just going to assume that you're running the latest kernel, OpenSSL, and Nginx. That should be a prerequisite, right? And if, in fact, if you don't do anything else, even if you just do this, you will already walk out a huge winner because there's just a lot of TCP improvements. There's a lot of OpenSSL performance improvements. And of course, Nginx, there's security patches, performance improvements, new features, and all the rest. Uh, you also want to make sure that you are, in fact, following the latest TLS recommendations. And the best place to, for that is actually the uh, Mozilla Security Wiki. Uh, if you guys haven't visited that yet, I recommend checking that out. The security team at uh, Mozilla actively updates this uh, with uh, every release. So that is the best place to get uh, the current recommendations. So now let's, let's get into the, the actual hands-on stuff. Right? A lot of the stuff is going to sound very boring because you're like, yeah, yeah, I know this. This is, this is so yesterday. But in reality, uh, when I talk to developers, most developers, they, they have no idea what this actually means. So take something like, uh, specifying intermediate certificates. So you, you buy your certificate, you get your certificate from your uh, CA. Chances are you also need an intermediate cert. You need to combine those certs and configure it on your Nginx server. How you combine that, most people don't even know. right? You, you basically have to assume that most developers don't even know how to cat two files together. And uh, this is a very common problem, something that we can address. Why is it that Nginx can't check for this by default? Right? Why can't we warn the user that, hey, I think you forgot to add an intermediate cert? This is a very common uh, misconfiguration. Another one is uh, online uh, certificate status protocol, which is we need to verify that the certificate is, in fact, valid. 
right, that, that hasn't been revoked for some reason. So there's a mechanism where uh, the browser will, uh, the, the certificate actually embeds an endpoint that says, here's where we can go check the status of, this, of the certificate. And if nothing else is present, the browser will stop once it gets the certificate and will issue that uh, query to the server. So that's what you're seeing here. I'm trying to open Wells Fargo, and it is, in fact, pausing the navigation and making a request to VeriSign to verify that the certificate is, in fact, valid. Uh, further, uh, in the case of Wells Fargo, they actually use two different certificates, so they also go to GeoTrust, right? So they get burned twice on this. And this, of course, adds a lot of latency. But there are workarounds for this sort of thing. Uh, we have SSL stapling, which basically allows the server to do some of this work on your behalf. It can talk to the OCS OCSP server, get the signed um, certificate, and uh, basically embed it alongside uh, the actual certificate, allowing the client to verify that it is still valid without making those extra round trips. So this stuff is supported in Nginx, but it's disabled by default. Right? This is one of those features that we should nudge people towards, like, hey, did you really mean to disable this? Sure, it's fine to have it disabled for maybe internal deployments, but as a rule of thumb, if it's default off, it's going to stay off for 90% of deployments, and that is a problem. So some questions based on the themes we've seen so far, right? Why doesn't we have a check mode that basically checks for the syntax of the config, but why doesn't that same mode nudged us and tell us like, hey, you've specified this certificate, but there's no intermediate. We can verify this. We can uh, give you warnings about these sorts of things. Uh, same thing for CSP. And maybe there should be a whole other mode. Maybe it shouldn't be the dash T. Maybe it should be another mode that actually walks you through, like, here's what you've configured. Here's what we think you should configure. And did you really mean to make this decision? Because most people won't even know what these things mean. Another common mistake that I see is, of course, redirect chains. So redirect chains are extremely, extremely expensive with HTTPS, and uh, it's not uncommon to see like three or four redirect chains. So you need a new TCP connection every time you do uh, you redirect to a new origin. There's also a new TLS handshake, and if you care about performance, you know that TLS handshakes are the expensive part uh, of, uh, of the negotiation. So that's really bad. And a very common mistake that I see is I'm willing to bet that even for the people that are here and you guys know what you're doing, you probably have an unnecessary redirect chain, which is it's very common for uh, a site to redirect their HTTP to, let's say, a dub, dub, dub. And what happens when they deploy HTTPS is they deploy the following chain. If you come to HTTP, we'll redirect you, redirect you to HTTPS, at which point you arrive at HTTPS and we'll tell you that you need to go to HTTPS, dub, dub, dub. Right? This is a great example of a common pattern that is very easy to get wrong because it basically requires that you actually refactor your config. And I think uh, it'll be really interesting to hear Igor, Igor talk about uh, the scalable configuration part because how do you uh, refactor your configs to avoid this sort of duplication? And uh, here we're talking about if you're on a 3G connection, this is probably half a second of latency, right? just based on uh, this one redirect. Uh, one tip that I can give you guys is HSTS. Uh, this is very cool in, because it allows us, allows us to enforce uh, policies around how the request uh, should be routed from the browser. So an HST, adding an HTTPS header basically tells the browser, hey, remember this policy for this, sub, for this origin and its subdomains that you should only request everything over H, uh, HTTPS. And once that's present, once the browser remembers that, you can actually skip, well, not can, it will skip the redirect because it will always request the HTTPS resource, which is uh, a nice performance uh, benefit. And then uh, you can also add your site uh, to the HSTS preload list, which basically means that the uh, browser comes with a list of preloaded sites which are known to be HTTPS friendly and HTTPS only, and we will only request uh, resources over HTTPS for those sites. So uh, that's something that uh, Chrome, uh, Firefox and uh, Safari all do, and I believe IE does as well. So those are the basics, right? Those are the uh, rudimentary things that most sites get wrong, yet are totally fixable. Now let's talk about some of the actual more interesting stuff. Like we talked about the textbook version and just like making sure that we get the textbook version of TLS handshake right, the two handshakes. We can actually do much better with Nginx in particular. 
So first is we have a resume handshake, which is uh, an ability to reuse the previously negotiated TLS parameters on when you establish a new session. And that is important because it allows us to skip the expensive part of the handshake, which is the uh, asymmetric crypto part. And the second case is TLS pulse start, uh, which is an optimization to the actual handshake protocol where we can skip a full RTT and deliver the full handshake experience in one RTT. The combination of two of these things basically means that you can deliver a reliable one RTT experience uh, to all of your users using Nginx. But you need to make sure that you configure this correctly. So resumption 101, there's two different methods. Both are supported by Nginx. We have session identifiers and session tickets. Ses session identifiers is a slightly older uh, model, and it basically requires that the server stores a cache um, of the negotiated parameters. Uh, the client has an opaque token that it sends, basically think of it as a cookie, and says, look, you've, you've seen me before, uh, look it up in your cache and let's reuse those parameters. Uh, for obvious reasons, that becomes a little bit more challenging to deploy in the multi-server deployment because now you need a shared cache and all the rest, which is why session tickets is usually the preferred method. The ses uh, with session tickets, all the data is actually encoded into this uh, opaque blob and is stored on the client, and the client delivers it when they negotiate the session. But uh, if you look at the configuration uh, for uh, Nginx, session tickets actually have a five minute timeout. Why is it five minutes? If you actually look at most of the popular servers, uh, services that are deployed today, it's typical to have a session ticket that is somewhere in the two hour range. And in fact, they're reusable for about a day because even though the tickets are being rotated on an hourly basis, uh, the old keys are still being retained for about a day such that if you come back within a day, we can still reuse that ticket and issue a new one. So uh, I would argue that this is in fact an, an, maybe an incorrect or a default that is definitely worth revisiting because five minutes is incredibly aggressive and uh, once again, if this is the default, this is what most sites will deploy. Uh, next one is TLS false start. This is probably a lesser known optimization, but a very important one. So this is something that applies to uh, all new TLS handshakes. And uh, the interesting gotcha here, and not gotcha, the optimization here is that if you're familiar with the full TLS handshake, you have the server, the client hello, server hello, and then you have the change cipher spec that needs to happen from both ends. Basically, you need to negotiate that, hey, I would like to use this cipher suite, the symmetric cipher suite, the server acknowledges, and then you start sending application data. The only optimization that happens with TLS false start is that when the client picks the cipher suite, it just optimistically assumes that the, the server will accept it and start sending data immediately afterwards. So that is the mechanism, once again, supported by uh, Nginx, works across all the major browsers, uh, but uh, there's a gotcha. And the gotcha is that some older servers and some older hardware don't support TLS false start. So because of that, it's actually an opt-in behavior. And different browsers use different heuristics for how we will, uh, how we will know to enable this optimization. And in fact, it's, it's kind of like a carrot for us to say, hey, if you want to have the fast experience, you need to do some things right. And for Chrome and Firefox, that means you need to have uh, forward secrecy cipher suite enabled, so something like Elixir Curve uh, Crypto. And uh, you also need to support ALPN and you just need to advertise this extension. You can just, you don't even have to support Speedy, you can just advertise that it's HTTP 1.1. And to us, that tells that you're a modern, uh, modern server. Chances are you won't break if we send you application data immediately after, and um, you'll get a faster experience. Similar, for, similar story for Safari and Internet Explorer. So the long story short for Nginx, ALPN is already enabled for you if you enable uh, HTTPS. That's good, that's a good example of a good default, just there by default, and uh, you don't have to worry about it. But you do need to configure forward secrecy. And speaking of defaults, here's a great example of something that uh, I think I've butted heads with uh, maybe Igor in the past, and I, I still think we, should, we can do better. So if you look at the time to first usable byte, which is my definition of usable byte, is something that the browser can start parsing. So think of an HTML document, this is the moment that I can start uh, and basically invoke my DOM parser to start constructing uh, the actual page. For a regular HTTP page, we have a DNS lookup, TCP handshake, we have the HTTP request, and basically at this point right here, after the green bar, we've received the first uh, payload of the HTML document that we can start parsing. The document is still being received because it's still being streamed over multiple TCP packets and all the rest, but I can already start parsing it. With just out of the box, taking a default config, enabling HTTPS, I get two round trips 
for the TLS handshake, which we know we can optimize to, to down to one, right? So that's one optimization. And second is, for some reason, I can't actually consume any of the bytes. The browser can consume any of the bytes for two RTTs instead of one. And the problem here is somewhat subtle, and it's because TLS actually packages up data in records. So Nginx is very, very good at optimizing for throughput and will be more than happy to serve your HTML files and all the other files uh, in the most optimal way uh, to optimize for throughput. In this case, it's taking an HTML file, which is just a static file, and it's packaging it into a 16 kilobyte record and ships it to the client. The client can't decode that record until it has all 16 kilobytes because it actually needs to run the checksum and verify that the Mac is right on the record and all the rest. And on a new connection, you're basically guaranteed to overflow the congestion window, and that means that you're imposing an extra RTT. So this is a great example of an optimization backfiring. You're optimizing for throughput, but for interactive traffic, it's actually suboptimal. So if you look at, at the configuration, uh, we've actually added, um, I think in 1.5.9, uh, a flag where you can configure the size of the, the record buffer, but by default it's 16K, which is the maximum TLS record size. And I would argue that for most workloads, for most interactive workloads, that is an incorrect default. For things like delivering video, yes, you want large records because you want to optimize for throughput. For interactive traffic where every, every uh, round trip counts, you want small packets. And the answer is not like, what is the right number? Is it eight kilobytes or four kilobytes or somewhere in between? Uh, the right answer, I think, is actually it doesn't matter. The server should just take care of this for me. And there are some good examples uh, that already do this. So we've had this optimization enabled on Google servers for many years, and it, we've seen huge improvements uh, in terms of our own latency uh, due to it. And the basic heuristic is you should start, when the connection is uh, new, you should start by sending small packets. You should just assume that uh, latency is important. And once you've sent enough data, that basically indicates that this is a bulk transfer or something that resembles a bulk transfer, you can increase the size of your records automatically. And then if you uh, go idle for a little while, let's say the, the HTTP flows stop and then you pause and then the user clicks on the next link, you restart and that's it. And we've removed those config configuration flags entirely from our servers and the server handles this automatically. So knobs are good, configuration knobs are good, but automated, uh, Automating these things is even better. So this is a kind of a, a quick summary of my experience of working with Nginx over the past uh, year. By default, if I just app get install and configure my certificate, I will get a 2RTT experience, which already assumes a lot of things about how I configured my server. I, I enabled uh, stapling, I enabled uh, I had my certificate deployed correctly and a bunch of other things. I think that's actually an optimistic uh, assumption. With a little bit of optimization, knowing that I, I need to lower my record size, I could reclaim another RTT, and once I enable false start and other things, I can actually get it down to one RTT. But to be honest, this took me like six months of research to actually wrap my head around like all of the gotchas, all of, all of the different options, and most people won't have that time. They won't know to do this, and that is why we need to figure out how to automate this stuff uh, in a much better way. And then finally, um, I still get the frequent answer of why not HTTPS, and it's the same reason that uh, we can get a lot of shiny things, which is performance. It's performance and cost, right? So what if I told you that in practice uh, at Google and some other companies that I've talked to that have deployed HTTPS, the operational load and the actual cost of running HTTPS servers is lower than the HTTP. And it may seem counterintuitive because you do add a lot of the CPU overhead in terms of crypto and all the rest. Uh, but what happens is once you've deployed HTTPS, you're basically there to deploying Speedy and HTTP2. And uh, I'm hoping to hear more about the plans of HTTP2 in Nginx Core um, at this conference because uh, it's, it's here effectively. Uh, both Chrome and Firefox have now enabled HTTP2 by default in their current browsers. And we have a good operational experience at Google showing that Speedy is actually de delivering a huge improvement in terms of the latency and performance of our applications. Now, it does require some modifications in terms of undoing some of the HTTP 1.1 1 .1 opt optimizations, hacks, and uh, we can deliver this. And what most people forget is that Speedy and HTTP 2 is designed to leverage a single connection. 
which operationally should so set off a lot of, uh, not alarms, good, good vibes. Because it means that there's fewer sockets, there's fewer buffers, there's better connection reuse, right? There's basically fewer connections that you need to deal with. Uh, the browsers are specifically designed to use one, one TCP connection when, whenever we use speedy and HTTP2. And there's also other things like uh, header compression, prioritization, and multiplexing, which actually means that we're placing a much higher burden on the server. We're actually shifting a lot of our logic from the browser into the server and placing a lot of trust into the server uh, to, do this, to do these things right. A good example is uh, our experience with Speedy, where some of the early implementations of various servers outside of Google uh, just does not respect the prioritization. And what would happen is that you would enable it and you would get a much worse, much worse experience because we would send you all the requests and say like, yes, I need all these images, I need all the JavaScript, I need all the HTML. And the server is very smart about like, oh great, I need to generate the HTML, which is critical, but I have all of these images and other things which are just static. So I'm just gonna fill the pipe with images. And that would take precedence over the actual critical data. So that is a great example of something that uh, servers need to do a much better job of. We need much better benchmarks than uh, transactions per second. That is no longer relevant. We need better benchmarks that are able to account for prioritization and how the data is being multiplexed. And as far as I, as I understand, I've, I've not seen anybody actually develop those sorts of workloads today. So in summary, uh, there's, I guess, two themes. One is HPS is everywhere and it's a new default. There's a lot of people flooding into the space right now because they're trying to enable HTTPS. And a lot of them running into these roadblocks of uh, I'm going to deploy the default. The default is not sufficient. And I'm not sure what I need to be doing. So this is something that we need to fix. But I guess a broader theme, which applies well outside of just the HTTPS theme that we've talked about here, is design for humans. Design your software for humans. A lot of people here work on core, contribute to core, you develop your own modules, you build platforms for other developers. Assume that these humans are smart, yes, they are willing to put in the effort, but then life happens, right? You have other things that come up, you forget. Uh, you don't have enough time to read the documentation. So we need to assume, we need to take uh, control over the defaults and make sure that uh, they are the right defaults. Not be afraid to change the defaults. And uh, add basically guardrails for the developers to help them along uh, that experience. And that is something that we can iterate on, right? We can ship a version that says, hey, you should enable these options, and then we can change that in the next version. Uh, that's something that is missing. I think that's something that could be done in core, that could be done as a third-party module, but it's definitely something we need to tackle as a community. And with that, uh, slides if you're interested over there, and I'd be happy to uh, chat with anybody afterwards if you guys have any ideas for how we can improve HCPS. Thank you. Thanks so much. <laughs>